Um, why don't you turn your Bible to John chapter 1. Yeah, today my son Malachi asked, uh, Daddy, is it time for us to start planting our garden? <laughs> yeah, buddy, this is usually the temperature where we start doing that. So I wish, I wish it were. All right. Uh, so we're in John tonight, but let me pray and then we'll jump in. Lord, we do thank you again for this day that you've given us, the night you have given us, this time you have given us allotted for your purposes and your kingdom. And thanks for the opportunity that we have to open your book and the blessing that it is to have you speak to us through your word. And so I pray that as we open the gospel of John this evening, that you would help us to have a greater view of Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished, and who he is, his person and his work, Lord. Help us to observe both carefully and be in awe of what you have done in him. And we pray it in his name. Amen. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is the marvelous opening prologue to the Gospel of John. And it's striking when we read it. And so the question that comes to mind is, we've been through three Gospels already, the Synoptic Gospels, and each one of those begins with a slightly different introduction. Luke tells us about his mission to construct an orderly account for Theophilus. Uh, Mark starts out describing the Son of God and how he's going to present him to you. Uh, Matthew begins giving us the genealogical history. And so the question that I want you to consider is this. Why does John begin this way? Why this opening? This seems like the opening of an epic novel, an epic series, not a biography. And so why don't you talk to the person next to you, speculate, postulate together. Why does he begin this way? Go ahead and do that now. Well, what do you think here? Why does John start this way? Does he, does he miss the memo? Does he think he was writing a Lord of the Rings prologue? I mean, what's, what's going on? Why does he start like this? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he zooms out to give us the universal view, there is the comment, and he goes all the way back to the beginning. And from what I've heard, that's a very good place to start. (laughs) (laughs) Other observations? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's more incredible. 
Yeah, yeah. So the comment here is, uh, Jesus didn't just come on the scene. He wasn't. He didn't begin existing when he was born. There's a story before that that's very important and even more incredible. Yeah, great observation. Yeah. It's a big picture overview. Yeah, big picture. Yeah, getting the big picture of what's happening. That's good. Yeah, well, these are all good comments and, and helpful just to kind of frame the gospel of John. When he starts in this way, we realize he's making a big theological claim about who Jesus is, creator God, and he's also preparing us for what he's going to present to us in this book. So I love that he starts this way. Um, and as we jump in, so obviously we're looking at the gospel of John, final of the gospel writers to speak here, uh, both in terms of the order we have in our New Testament, as well as chronologically, he's the last to speak. And so it's a fitting place for John. And he is the non-synoptic of these gospels. So these three guys, lots of overlap between them. John, 92% new material in this gospel. And so very unique in his writing style. But that's what we're looking at, last of the gospels, second to last of the narrative books in, in the New Testament here. And so helpful just to to compare as we look across these Gospels. So again, this is on page 24 of your manual where you can compare these Gospel accounts together. And you can see that uh, we've already seen Matthew, Mark, and Luke and the different emphases they have on the teachings, miracles, and parables of Jesus. John is really focused on the doctrine of who Jesus is. He's a theological writer. He's the theologian among them. And so theology is a fancy way of saying the thoughts you think about God, how you think about God, the categories you have for God. That's what John is focused on focused in on about who Jesus is categorically as God. And so the portrait of Christ here is his deity, the perfect son of God. That's the aspect. So a very good comparison here between Luke and John because it shows us both the humanity and the deity of Jesus. And John's, John's trajectory here is global. It's for all Christians. It's universal. Uh, by the time John is writing, there have been several decades already of church history, of the gospel being spread throughout the world. And so He's writing now to a universal church. And the emphasis, the key word of the Gospel of John is that word believe. Believe, believe, believe. You're going to see it repeated in almost every story that we open tonight in the Gospel of John. And so that's his emphasis is the word believe. And so as we're looking at the New Testament, like once again, we just want to look at the three tests of authorship. Three ways that, that the early church recognized the divinity of these books, the inspiration held within these books. Uh, author, are they firsthand authorship, uh, apostle, or somebody close to them? With John, that's going to be a slam dunk. It's going to be easy because John is an apostle. Uh, early church acceptance and then harmony with the rest of the Bible. And so when we look at John... John the Apostle, the fast one, he's the one that is writing this book. And so when we look at the authorship of John, John is the Apostle John. He's the author of First, Second, and Third John, as well as the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation. These are the, the five books that the Apostle John authors. Uh, he's the Apostle. He's also one of the sons of Zebedee. If you remember Jesus calling him and James uh, Boanerges, uh, sons of thunder, sons of Zebedee. And so he and his brother hold a significant place there. Uh, He is referred to in his gospel here as the disciple Jesus loved or the other disciple. He never uses his own name in his gospel. He describes himself, instead he chooses to identify as the disciple Jesus loved and the other disciple. And so one thing to remember is the omission of John's name really reveals both his humility and and also his authorship. Just like the other authors don't mention themselves in their gospel accounts, so too with John. And his omission is, is more glaring because he's in the story. He, he's right there present and he's named 20 times in the other gospel accounts, but not in this one. Instead, we get the disciple Jesus loved. So it's very clear that this is the apostle John who is writing this book. And so 20 references there in the other Gospels, none in this one by name. He's always referring to himself as the disciple Jesus loved, or uh, he calls himself the other disciple when he beats Peter to the tomb after the resurrection. Interesting that he chose to include that fact too. He's faster than Peter. So that's the authorship. So we have firsthand authorship here. John was present. He witnessed these events. He was one of the, the men in the transfiguration that got to see Jesus in glory. So he was right there leaning against Jesus at the Last Supper. And so he's right there. He's present. Authorship. Uh, in terms of early church acceptance, once again, Irenaeus, I showed you this last time we, we were talking about Luke, but also notice that John is here as well. And Irenaeus gets the chronology right here in terms of order of authorship. He says, after Luke writes, afterwards, John the disciple of the Lord, 
who also leaned upon his chest, so he was the one at the Last Supper, the disciple Jesus loved, leaning against him, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. So a high degree of certainty that he's the author because Irenaeus, very close to the time of this writing, points out John wrote it, and here's the place he was when he wrote it. I can tell you not just who wrote it, but where he was when he authored this gospel. Uh, And then here's something from Clement of Alexandria. Here's what he says about John as the author of this book. As for John, the last, upon seeing that in the Gospels they had told the corporeal, corporeal matters, so the bodily matters, the physical matters, supported by his disciples and inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote a spiritual gospel. So a spiritual gospel, a theological gospel, a gospel about uh, the, the divinity of who Jesus is. And notice that both of, the, both of these men identify John as the last of the gospel writers to write, and rightly so. And so uh, John enjoys broad acceptance as, as an inspired book in the New Testament. So why does he write? What purpose does he have in writing? Well, he's writing roughly around 90 A.D., and uh, he's likely the last of the gospel authors here to be authoring his books. In fact, the final, his, his works, John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, are probably the final five books in that order in the New Testament that are authored. That's probably the, the last books that are written in the New Testament. And so it's fitting that John authors this book at this time for a church that has been growing for a period of time. Uh, In John, and we already mentioned, 92% of the material in John is unique to John. So it's new material. And it's a theological account of the life of Jesus. How should we think about Jesus? What should we do in response to who Jesus is? And John really gives us the heavenly view of Jesus. I think that's part of why his, his gospel begins by zooming way out and showing us all the way at the beginning, here is the eternal son of glory and here's what he's come to do. And so he's giving us a theological, a big heavenly view versus just an earthly view of the life of Christ. Uh, a couple of key words to keep in mind. John has a number of important words that he uses time and again. Uh, these are just a few of them. So obviously believe is a significant word in the gospel of John. Uh, we're going to see that in the verse we'll show you next, John's purpose statement. Also sign is a significant word. He structures his book around seven signs that Jesus does to demonstrate who he is as this eternal son of glory. And then life is another important word for John, that life is found in him. And sometimes he uses the word light, sometimes he uses life, but he's pointing to the eternal life that happens through Jesus Christ. So the seven signs, again, a key piece of the structure of the gospel of John, as well as there's seven I am statements in the book. Uh, And if you were here when Mondo Gonzalez spoke, you'll know that there's also seven occurrences of the hour. The hour had not yet come. My hour is not yet here. And then finally at the end, he says, now the hour has come, Father. And so John likes the number seven and he likes the repetition of these things. But the signs is what the book is structured after. These other things John uses to highlight different themes. The signs show us uh, who Jesus is by his works. The I am statements show us who Jesus is by his title. So that's why those two things pair well together, by his works and by his title. So let's look at the first word there, the word believe. Uh, Why is that so significant? Because John tells us the purpose of his book. I love it when we have clear writing. When you were growing up, did your English teacher make you write a thesis statement? You had to like say what you were going to say in the paper so that sometimes, I mean, some of my early papers were just a collection of abstract facts I found, and I've assembled them together in in an order, and maybe you can make sense of this. And the teacher said, no, you have to have a purpose statement. Why am I reading all these citations? What have you brought, like, all these quotations together for, hijacked against their will into your paper? What is this? You have to have a a purpose statement, a thesis. John gives us his thesis. Here's what he says. This is towards the end of his book, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, purpose statement. Now Jesus did many other signs. Now remember, John's writing about seven signs, a select group of signs, in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Okay, so he did more than what's written here. But these, these seven are written, notice the purpose statement then, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, And that, by believing, you may have life in his name. 
And so we see all the key words of John in harmony together here. So the signs, there's many other signs, but these signs, these seven, why are these recorded for you? They're written so that you may believe, so that you can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That you may believe, and notice he tells us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So he's the Messiah, and he's God. And that by believing, if you believe that about Jesus Christ, if you believe in what he has done, that by believing in him, you may have life, eternal life, in his name. That's why John is writing this book. And he's desperate for his reader to see who Jesus is, to see that he truly is the Messiah who's come to pay for sin, and he's creator God in flesh. That's what John wants us to see when we're looking at the signs in his book. The signs are meant to lead us to belief in Christ that leads us to eternal life. That's the goal. That's the purpose. So if you, if you get that, if you understand those two verses, you understand what John's trying to accomplish in his book. So the rest of the book is, is fleshing out that singular purpose, uh, believing. And this, this word belief uh, in the Greek, in this particular occurrence, it's the word pisteo, pistuo, pisteo, and it happens uh, a number of times within the New Testament, but this Greek word for belief um, has, to do, has to do with putting your faith, putting your trust in something. And belief is a significant word in John's book. Now, this is just that particular construction, grammatical construction of the word believe, but notice the emphasis John has on belief. The other authors touch on this. The book of Acts touches on this, but John is laser-focused on belief. Eighty-five times he uses the word believe, 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 believe. That's what makes John really easy. When, when seminary students are learning Greek, we study John first because he uses the same words on repeat. And so you can actually identify and start to catch like, oh, I learned five words, but he used all of them. Great. And so John, laser focused on belief. And when we think of this idea of belief, we have to consider what, what, what faith is. Belief, faith, these are, this Greek word is translated both ways here. But the idea of belief, really saving faith, has three aspects, three things you need to think about. Because sometimes people use the word believe in a lot of different ways, like, are we having lunch just Tuesday, next Tuesday? Yeah, I believe so. I think, some, sometimes people use it as like, I think so. But belief here, uh, saving faith, saving belief, has to do with three things. First thing is, a saving faith, a saving belief, understands the facts about who Jesus is. That's why John will record seven signs of who Jesus is and the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus because we have to understand the facts. You have to have the facts to have something to believe. Second thing you need for saving faith, for saving belief, is you have to have mental assent to those facts. So you, you could tell me all day that he's done those things, but at some point I have to, I have to say, yes, that happened. Yes, I agree. There was a man named Jesus. He died on a cross. He rose again. I agree mentally with those facts. But even that's not enough, because the Bible tells us even the demons believe that intellectually, but not with a a saving sort of trust. And so the third thing you need is, is a saving trust in those facts. So you have to understand who Jesus is, what he has done. You have to agree, yes, he truly lived and did those things. And then thirdly, and now I trust in what he has done and not what I have done. And those three levels are important to consider as we look at belief in John. John's going to present us with the facts. He's going to show us detailed accounts so we might agree with those facts, but he wants to get us to the heart level of a saving trust in Jesus. This is the Son of God. He has paid for me. I trust him and not myself with my eternal soul. That's where John's trying to get us. So with that in mind, remember at the end, we're going to look at the three core questions we ask for every book. Who is God in this book? How does it point to Jesus? And why did the Holy Spirit inspire this book? Why is this book in our canon of Scripture? With that, let's jump into John. Uh, Page 61 is where you'll find the outline for the book in your manual. Uh, Page 61, uh, Dr. Mock has a good outline here for us uh, of the Gospel of John. And in his way, he's got the the alliteration happening. And so page 61 is where you can see that. I've got a cleaned up version of that so you can see it from far away here. Uh, But this is the general outline here of the Gospel of John. And once again, the purpose verse there is at the bottom. These are written so you may believe. That's what John is emphasizing. Uh, And John's book breaks down nicely into roughly five sections. Sometimes people split this last one into two, but five main sections. Uh, First one is the prologue. 
We read most of that together already, uh, where it's describing the, the in the beginning. John begins all the way back in eternity past. At the, at the start of creation, he emphasizes the word. We'll look at what he means by the word. What is this word that is with God and was God? It's what John emphasizes. And then also, he points out the purpose of this all is to make God known. Verse 18, significant. To make God known. That's why everything that happens there in the prologue happens. Uh, then chapters 1, second half of chapter 1 through chapter 12 is the public ministry of Jesus. And so this is when he is traveling and teaching. Uh, and this is a different presentation than we see in the other, the other gospels because this is structured around those seven signs, so seven miracles that Jesus does to demonstrate who he is. And the emphasis with each one is to believe. Believe, believe, believe occurs all throughout it. And we'll also see the I am statements Jesus makes about himself that take place during this period of time. Following his public ministry, then we move to the private ministry. That's where Jesus is with his disciples and he's giving them final instructions before his departure. And so that's chapters 13 through 17. And that's where we'll see uh, he tells them that he is the way of salvation. There's a helper who's going to come and he prays for them, for himself, and for all believers. Following that, we get the passion narrative. That's the trial, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then John concludes his book by restating his purpose and by showing us a, a unique picture of both Peter and himself and their final encounters with Jesus. So that's what we can expect as we jump into this book. And so we'll start at the beginning there with the prologue. So uh, chapter 1, verse 1, is the prologue statement. And so that's what we read at the start here. Verses 1 through 18 is the prologue to John's gospel. And I really want to start by zeroing in on verses 1 through 3. Because these verses are significant for understanding what John is trying to articulate. Uh, when he says, in the beginning, we get echoes of Genesis 1-1. Right? In the beginning, in the beginning. And so he's echoing all the way back. He's trying to get the reader to think back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. That's how far back John's gospel begins. And so he starts thousands of years before the birth of Christ. And he says, at that point in time, before the creation of the world, right, in the beginning, and isn't it kind of silly to use a time-bound statement to describe something that happens outside of time? Like, there wasn't even time yet, and we call it the beginning, which is a starting point for something. But anyway, you can blow your mind when you think about things like that. And he says, in the beginning was the Word. And when he uses the statement, the Word, the Logos, it's a unique phrase because this, this statement, the Word, would speak to both Greeks and to Jews. It would resonate with them both. Uh, uh, Greek philosophers thought that the creation had to come from somewhere. And they didn't have a category for, for what that was. And so they just called that the logos, the force, the, the, the whatever's out there that started this all. They said there's something started this. We're not certain what it is, but we call it the logos. And in Jewish history, uh, the word of God would come and reveal God. And so the Logos here, when Jesus is being personified, this is a description of Jesus as the Logos to both Greeks and to Jews, it would say this is a significant person and this is the person who started it all. So the Logos that you speak of, that's actually Jesus Christ. It's not just an impersonal force. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who, who's with God in the beginning. Uh, the, the word of God, the, the revelation of God, that's Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Both threads are pulled together here in this one word. So he says, this word, so the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what the word refers to, was in the beginning. So we understand the first thing we learn about Jesus, he is eternal. He didn't start existing at a, at a moment in time. He's eternal. He's in the beginning. And the word was with God. Second thing we learn, the word's in the beginning, and the word is present with God. There is a distinction here. Between, between God the Father and the Word. God the Father and the Word. There's a distinction between Father and Son. So we're not smushing the Trinity together. We're seeing with clarity that all three persons of the Trinity are present in eternity past. And notice then it repeats again, and the Word was God. So he's with God and he was God. He's with God and he is God. He's trying to capture for us in one sentence some of the per complexity of who this triune God is. That you can be with God because, because you're distinct persons, but you are God because you are one being the, the, the God, in the Godhead. 
So notice that it continues. He was in the beginning with God. Again, the with peace emphasized. So we see unity and distinction. And all things were made through him. Here's another thing we learn about this person, the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn that he is the creator of all things. That's significant because there's two categories. There's things created and things not created. And if Jesus created all things, he's in the category of not created because he made it all. That's an important distinction there because sometimes you'll get Mormons who will say, well, I don't know if that should be a definite article because maybe it was a God. Well, just go down to the next verse and say, well, all things are made through him. Not a created being, Jesus Christ, creator God from the start. And that settles it. So there's your, there's your linchpin if you're, if you're talking to a Mormon. Made through him. And then notice, he doubles down on it. Positive and negative assertions. And without him, so apart from Jesus, nothing was made that was made. So everything's made through him. And anything you see that was made, it was made through him. Nothing that you see was not made through Jesus. Double negative there, which is kind of confusing, right? To say it in the negative, but it's clarifying. It's helpful. Uh, Not anything made was made through him. Good. So we capture this. We're trying to wrap our mind around, okay, Our mind is reeling already. We're three verses in to John's theological gospel. And we have been introduced to the creator God who is present from eternity past. But there's a unity and distinction going on within the creator God. And also he made everything. And so our mind can be reeling at this point as we think about it. But remember, one thing we need to highlight is this this doctrine of the Trinity. And so that's what's at play here when he's describing how the word was with God and the word was God. Uh, the Son here, being described as the Word, he is, he is God. He is creator God, part of the triune God, part of the Godhead. But there's a distinction here between the Son and the Father. There are different persons within the one God. And so that's just an important category to keep in mind as we think about who Jesus is because John's really trying to show us the divinity of Jesus. And anytime we approach the divinity of Jesus, we've got to consider the Trinity that that God the Son is truly God of truly God. And there is only one God. And within that one God, there are three persons of the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And there's distinction between each of them. And we're going to see uh, here at the start, we see the Father and Son expressed in distinction from one another. Later on in, in uh, chapter, four, chapter 14, 15, 16, we're going to see God the Son making a distinction between himself and the Holy Spirit, but still as part of the triune Godhead. So we're already starting, starting off with a lot of theology here in the Gospel of John. And, and as we look then at the public ministry of Jesus, John jumps pretty quickly into this public ministry. And so some things just to notice, I, I forgot to point out to you here in the prologue, a, a couple things. Notice that verses 1 through 3 demonstrate the, the triune nature of God, that Jesus Christ is from the beginning. And it describes the rejection of Jesus by that which he has made. John describes here in poetic terms how when Jesus came, he was rejected by his own creation, which is a staggering thought. But verse 12 is significant. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, born not of blood, who were born not of blood, of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And then verse 14, And the word, creator God from eternity past, became flesh and dwelt among us. And so with, with that expression there, the word became flesh, that's the incarnation, Jesus taking on a, a human nature in addition to his divine nature, and then his habitation. He dwelt with us. The creator God actually came. It wasn't just a, a mirage or a hologram. He actually came and dwelt on this planet that he had made. And then it says, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then verse 18. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Jesus has come to make the Father known, to make God known. That's his purpose here in the prologue. And then as the ministry begins, uh, John the Baptist testifies that, 
hey, I'm, I'm not the Messiah. I came to point out to you who the Messiah is. He points out to Jesus in verse uh, 25. Behold, there's the Lamb of God. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus begins to call his first disciples. And then when the public ministry kicks off, really chapter 2, verse 1, is the kickoff of, of really the public ministry of Jesus Christ. And it's the first sign that we see. And if you've been to a wedding, you probably have heard this story referenced. Uh, oftentimes weddings will begin, you know, we need to acknowledge, first of all, that, that marriage is not a human institution, but it's created by God. And the Lord Jesus blessed marriage when he you know, was at the wedding at Cana. And they're referring to this story, right? That's the story they're pointing to. And so in this story, Jesus and his family here, they're at a wedding. And uh, he's there with his mother. He's there with the disciples. And the wine runs out. So the drink runs out. And the mother of Jesus, Mary, says to him, they have no wine. Notice Jesus' response. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. You hear the hour there. It's not, it's not time yet. It's not time yet, Mom, for me to show them who I am. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Okay, so I guess he's on the spot. He's supposed to, you're going to fix the problem. This is yours to fix. So there's six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Okay, so you've got roughly 120 to 180 gallons of water sitting in front of Jesus. And he says to the servants, fill them with water. And they fill them to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it come from. Though the servants who drew the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom, called the groom, and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine but you have kept the good wine until now. So what does he do? He turned 120, 180 gallons of water into wine, not just average wine, good wine, the best wine. And then verse 11, this is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So verse 11 is significant. That's why the story is placed here for us. Not just a cool trick that Jesus did, but the point is, it's the first sign. One of the first times now where he does something that's, that's totally beyond human capacity to transform water in that way. And notice the statement, and manifested his glory. His glory is on display through this sign. And the result then is, and his disciples believed in him. His disciples are following him already at this point, but they believe in a unique way when they see the sign. They believe that he is something more than just your average rabbi walking around Galilee. There's something more going on here. And so these are the signs that Jesus does. And now sign, we often think of street signs, road signs, when we think of sign, but sign really has the effect of meaning it, they're, they're miracles that demonstrate and identify who Jesus is. And so that's why John gives us seven signs here to demonstrate and identify who Jesus is. Now, if you've got your study Bible, you will notice that MacArthur gives us a bonus sign. So 1436 in your study Bible, because there's one sign that happens after the resurrection. But the primary ministry of Jesus is structured around those first seven signs. So MacArthur gives us the bonus sign there. Uh, but in your manual, Dr. Mock gives us the... Uh, the seven primary signs which occur prior to, uh, prior to his crucifixion. But these seven signs structure the, the next portion here of the book. And so that's significant. I would say turn to one of those. Have one of those open just so you can kind of track along with us together, either in your study Bible or in the manual, as we look at the public ministry of Jesus. Uh, but following this first sign, and notice John is very intentional. Uh, just like you when you're writing a paper with three points, first, second, third, in conclusion, here, John, here's the first sign. He's going to number the second sign for us as well. But from there, he's going to leave it to us to count the signs as we're walking through them in his public ministry. And so the seven signs begin, but then he describes for us the nature of belief. And so we're going to look at chapter three then, when Jesus speaks with Nicodemus, because this helps us to understand what John's purpose is. If John's purpose is for me to believe, well, John, what does that mean? What do you mean when you're telling me to believe? I, I gave you a biblical definition of belief, but here's John's definition of belief in chapter 3. Chapter 3, he tells the story of Nicodemus. It's, it begins in this way. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees 
named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, so a man of some stature. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus has observed correctly. No one can do these miracles except for if God is with them. Jesus answers him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Strange response. No one can do these signs. You need to be born again. Nicodemus responds, and Nicodemus says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? This is a theme in the Gospel of John, not only being born again, but also people misunderstanding Jesus. Here Nicodemus thinks he's talking about literal birth. Jesus is going to describe to him how he's speaking of spiritual birth. But think about when Jesus meets the woman at the well. She asks for water. He says, I can give you living water. And she says, you don't have a bucket. He's not talking about the water in the well. He's talking about spiritual life. Or when Lazarus is sick. And our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. He says, they say, Jesus, he's not asleep. He died. I know he died. I know he died. But for your sake, I'm glad so that you can see the glory of God. And so this is a the theme in John of people misunderstanding what Jesus has said. But notice then his response to this. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you. And when Jesus says that statement, it doesn't mean what he, the other things he said has been false, but that this is an emphatic thing you need to pay attention to. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone that's born of the Spirit. And so Nicodemus is trying to wrap his mind around this. This is a new category. Born of the Spirit? The wind, the spirit moves and I can't see it. What is he talking about? And in verse 9, he says to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answers, are you the teacher of Israel? Yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. We bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you don't believe them, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus is trying to get him to the next category, to understand and believe the spiritual reality that's going on. If you don't believe this, the earthly physical things I'm talking about, how do I get you to the place where you can understand what it is to be born of the Spirit, to be regenerated by the Holy Spirit, to have your eyes opened to eternity? How can you do this? Verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And then notice verse 14. I love verse 14. He says this, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And so Nicodemus, here's, here's what it looks like to be born again. Do you remember when, when Moses had to lift up that serpent in the wilderness? Well, what had happened? The people had been complaining. They looked at the manna, the miracle food God was providing for them when they were wanderers in the wilderness for 40 years. And they looked at that food and they said, we loathe this worthless food. And whenever I think of that statement, I, I just imagine what would happen to me if I looked at a dinner prepared for me by my wife and I said, I loathe this worthless food. You'd have my funeral next week. But here they say that to God about miracle food. And so God rightly judges them for this, for this blasphemy against him. And he sends these fiery serpents, poisonous snakes, to bite them. And as they're likely perishing because they're poisoned by these snakes, God instructs Moses to make a bronze snake and hold it up on a stick. And he says, tell them if they look at the snake on the stick, they'll be healed. A strange thing to do. Not a practice you would see in modern medicine. Look at this stick, you're going to be healed. But the point was, if they looked, they believed that God would keep his word. And by looking and believing, they were demonstrating their trust. And Jesus is saying, that's what's going to happen when the Son of Man is lifted up. When he's lifted up on this cross, 
by looking and believing. Look at what he has done. Believe that God will heal your soul. He will make you righteous before him. That's what belief looks like. So I love this Old Testament picture that he gives us here to help us to see what it is to believe. And then the next verse, most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus speaking of himself, so that whoever believes in him, whoever looks on him for salvation, should not perish, just like those people in the wilderness, but have eternal life, but have life once again. And so this is the nature of belief. Look at what Jesus has done and trust in him. That's what John is trying to get the crowd to do here. Now, there's, there's seven signs here, and time would fail us if we were to go through each of these signs. But there's seven signs here, and so I just want you to look at that list of signs, either in your study Bible page or here together, and notice the, the, the signs that occur. We're going we're gonna to crank down through these, and then we, we'll focus in on the last one. Because there's seven of them, right? I can't preach a seven-point sermon. I could barely get through a three-point sermon. So we're going to go, we're going to go through this fast here. But we're going to see that in chapter four, there is a son of Caper- a Capernaum official, and he's healed. And he's healed from a distance far away. And so Jesus has the power to heal. And time and space do not restrict him as the son of God. We see him heal the paralytic at the pool. And so we see once again that that life, forgiveness, is found in Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus feeds the 5,000. He he multiplies the bread there as they they break it and break it and break it and break it. And everybody's fed. They're all full. There's 12 baskets at the end. And it shows us that, that Jesus has power over the physical world. And he has power to sustain those who are his. Jesus then, after that, the disciples go to the other side and he walks out on the sea, showing once again that he is Lord over the creation, walking on the water. And then chapter 9, I just want to highlight for you a couple phrases from chapter 9. Jesus heals a blind man here in chapter 9. And the, the disciples ask Jesus a fascinating question. They say, who sinned, this man, the blind man, or his parents, that he was born blind? They were living in a karma type of worldview where you do something bad, something bad happens to you, okay? Who caused this blindness? Was it him or was it his parents that he was born blind? Jesus' response in chapter 9, verse 3, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the work of God might be displayed in him. And so I love that statement. From eternity past, God knew this man would be born blind and he purposed it so that on this day he would have an unbelievable encounter with the Son of God and have his sight restored. This is better than 30 years of physical sight. Seeing Jesus for the first time with your physical eyes, that is better, meeting the Lord. And so this happens for the man. And the Pharisees are trying to figure out how can this be that a man born blind is healed? They interview the neighbors. They don't have an answer. They interview the man. He says, I met Jesus. He healed my eyes. They interview the parents. The parents don't want to answer. They don't want to be on trial before the Pharisees. They say, he's an adult. Ask him. They go to the man again. He says, this I know. I once was blind, but now I see. That's all I know. Jesus healed me. That's all I got. What a great example of the simplicity of belief. I don't have all the answers. I don't know why I can see. I don't know if he like fixed the molecules in my eyes or if there were cataracts. I don't know what happened, but I know Jesus healed me belief. I just know Jesus saved me. That's all I know. And they say in verse 32, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone has opened the eyes of a, of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That's his testimony. He must be from God to be able to do this. And the Pharisees hate him for this. And they say, you were born in sin and you would teach us. And so here we can see the fault lines forming. Many are believing in Jesus, but some do not believe. Some believe, some do not. That's a pattern repeated here all throughout these signs. What you'll you'll notice if if you dig into each of those is that at the end of each story, some believe and some do not. And John is setting the table to ask you the question, what about you? Do you believe Which party are you with? Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, son of God, come to pay for sin? Or do you disbelieve? And so Jesus then uses the word believe three times as he concludes his discussion here with the man born blind. 
So that's what he's emphasizing here. And it's at this point that we can turn over to chapter 11, where we'll look at the death of Lazarus. Uh, But as you do that, I just want to highlight for you too, this is where the I am statements begin to kick in as well. Following the fifth sign is where these I am statements begin to be displayed. And this is a significant, significant, significant statement. Uh, If you remember back in the Old Testament, when God has asked his, his name, sometimes he simply just says, I am. What's my, tell them I am has sent you. That's what he says to them. And so when Jesus uses the statement, I am, he has seven titles that he describes himself with, with this statement, this phrasing, uh, I am. It's a unique grammatical construction. And Jesus, Jesus is intending to communicate that he is creator God. And not only that, he demonstrates different aspects of that. So I'm the bread of life. Jesus is where eternal life is found. It's where eternal sustenance is found. He's the light of the world. He's the one who reveals the way of salvation. Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. He is the access point. The way to get to God is through Jesus. It's not through the law. Uh, It's not through Muhammad. It's through Jesus. He's the access point. He's the good shepherd. He's the one who knows, protects, and cares for those who are his. He is the resurrection and the life. And that's what we'll see in chapter 11 here. He is the source of all life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the true vine, the one in whom abundant spiritual life is found. And it feels like a disservice to the I am statements to go through them so quickly like that. But the point is that this is another uh, layer of what, uh, of what John is doing here in his gospel, in this public ministry of Jesus, that's, that's right there alongside these signs. Uh, but back to the seven signs. Let's look at chapter 11. I just want to highlight for you a couple of key phrases So if you remember the story, Lazarus has died and Jesus delayed in going because he intended for this to happen so that the glory of God could be on display. And so when Jesus arrives on the scene, so chapter 11 describes uh, him and the disciples debating when they should go, Lazarus dies. And then look at verse 14 and 15 of chapter 11. The disciples, this is where they don't understand. If he's asleep, we don't need to go we don't need to like go pay our respects, but he is actually dead. And so then Jesus said to them plainly in verse 14, Lazarus has died and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go. And so Jesus here, I'm glad I wasn't there to prevent this. Why? So that you can believe that I have power over this. Uh, Verse 21, Martha comes outside and meets him, she makes a similar statement to what the disciples said. They've seen Jesus heal people who are sick. They've seen him heal blind people, but they don't know that he truly has the power over death yet. And so she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Why? Because you could have healed him. You could have stopped this. You could have prevented this. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha misunderstands what Jesus is talking about. She thinks, well, yes, at the last day, he'll rise. She says it there. I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus is not talking about someday. He's talking about today. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this? And I love that question. Martha, I'm the resurrection. Life is in me. Do you believe it? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. An incredible statement for the first time here from from human lips, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. First time here that we, that we read it here in chapter 11, someone proclaiming exactly who Jesus is as John wants us to see him. And so following this, uh, you'll remember Jesus is troubled, he's moved, he weeps. And then as he approaches the tomb, verse 40, look at the statement of Jesus. I'm just trying to highlight the, the thread of belief. It's all throughout these accounts. He says this to, to her, to Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
So they roll the stone away after a complaint about we shouldn't roll it away. It's going to stink if we open that up. The, the body's been decaying in there. And he says this. He prays, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Notice the past tense of the statement. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. And up until this point, it's been 42 verses. Notice how long the resurrection takes. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, hands and feet bound with linen strips, like a mummy almost, his face wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. It happens in a moment. And then the response Many of the Jews who had come with Mary and saw what he did believed in him, in Jesus. And it's at this point the Pharisees begin to plot his demise, to plot his crucifixion. And so this is the the division once again. Some believed, some do not. And so the question is, do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? That's the public ministry here of Jesus. And so then let's look at the private ministry. So following the public ministry, that's the seven signs. Then he speaks with the disciples. And you can see that in John's gospel, John is still really focused in on the people's belief. Do do you believe that I am who I say I am? Do you believe that I'm creator God who has come? And so we're going to see uh, that Jesus is the way. That's chapter 14. That the helper will come. That's chapter 16. And we'll see his high priestly prayer. And so if you look at, with me at uh, chapter 14, one key statement to point out to you. He's telling his disciples now, very plainly, very plainly that he's going he's gonna to die, he's going to go, he's going to depart. And in verse 6, we get another one of the I am statements. They're, he's told them he's going to leave, and, and they say, how do we know where you're going? He tells them, well, you know where I'm going. How do we know? I don't know the way. I can barely get to Jerusalem from Galilee. How do I know where you're going? And so Jesus says to him, to Thomas, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is the way of salvation. Belief in him is the way to eternal life. Uh, With that, flip over to chapter 16, because Jesus makes an amazing statement here in chapter 16. So he's about to leave them. Remember, he's told them he's going. He's told them he is the way to where they want to go. But in verse 7 of chapter 16, here's a statement he makes that I want you to consider and think about. He says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Nevertheless, it's to your advantage that I go away. They've been walking with Jesus, seeing his ministry for a number of years. And so the question that comes to mind is, how can it be better for Jesus to leave? I mean, how many times have you wished that you could feel the Lord's presence with you? What if he were sitting next to you in in that pew right now? Wouldn't you think that's really good? But Jesus says, what you have now is better than him physically present next to you. How is that possible? Talk to the person next to you. Think about this. What do you think about this question? Chapter 16, verse 7, he says it's better for the disciples that, that he goes. I mean... I don't know about you, but sitting right next to my Savior, that would, that would feel pretty good. And so how can it be better? What do you think about this question? Dwelling in us and not among us is much more helpful as far as illuminating the Scriptures, teaching. Okay. Fight sin. Great observation, yeah. When the Helper comes, Jesus will dwell within us. And so Jesus dwelling in us, helping us to see Scripture, helping us to renew our minds, that is better than him next to us. That's a great observation. Jesus in you, better than Jesus beside you. Other observations? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, physically, physical body, one place at one time. We know right now his glorified body is at the right hand of the Father. His physical body can be present one place at one time, but spiritually, through the Holy Spirit, 
that allows him to dwell within all of his people. Yeah, there's multiplication that happens. Great observation. Anything else that makes it better? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the comment here is, if Jesus was still present, they would be very dependent on, on being with him there. And, and with him departing, they're still depending on him through the Spirit, but they're also able to scatter and preach. And so it, it affects the spread of the church. Good observation. That kind of goes back to the physically present one place at one time observation as well. Yeah, good, good thought. Well, good. It's, it's a striking statement. I mean, that's one where, first time I read that, I thought, better? Better? How is it better? But as you read down through the chapter, in verse six, chapter 16, verse 7, he says it's better. And then notice what he says to them. Well, what does the Holy Spirit do? Jesus within you is better than Jesus simply standing beside you. And it's because when the helper comes, helper should be capitalized there. That's the Holy Spirit he's describing. Uh, when the helper comes, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. So first thing is, there's going to be conviction. So within your heart, you're going to, you're going to have you know, a, a conscience, but better than a conscience, it's the Holy Spirit convicting you, guiding you in what is right and what is wrong. It's not just a lecture you're listening to. It's actually within you, conviction from within. Uh, verse, the second observation, uh, look at verse 13. Here's the second thing the Holy Spirit will do when he comes. And also notice the Spirit is a he, not an it, right? When he comes, the helper comes, it's a person, person of the Godhead, not an impersonal force. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will guide you into all the truth. And when I see that statement, all the truth, well, what truth does he mean? What truth does Jesus mean? Does, does John mean when he writes this? What does Jesus define as truth? We know that he is the truth. And so when we ask that question, well, is it all the truth about like, about who's behind the Kennedy assassination? Is that the truth that he's going to lead me into? Is he going to lead me to the truth of what's actually at the bottom of the, of the Mariana Trench? We can actually see what's down there. What is the truth that he's speaking of? Well, it's not just a broad, vague category of truth. Look two columns over there in your Bible. John 17, 17, we have truth defined for us. John 17, 17, he says it this way. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. It's a very specific truth. The truth of the Bible, the truth of God's word. That's the truth the Holy Spirit will illuminate for believers. That's the truth that's on display there. And so that's the second aspect. He's going to convict of sin. He's going to guide us in the truth, illuminating scripture. And then thirdly, it's in verse 14 of chapter 16, he will glorify me. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. So three purposes here for the Spirit's ministry in our life, conviction, illumination, and also glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the ministry of the Spirit. And he does it by, by declaring to us in scripture what is there. And so I love this statement about the, the value of scripture. Uh, here's what Sproul says about this. I think the greatest weakness in the church today is that almost no one believes that God invests his power in the Bible. Everyone's looking for power in a program, in a technique, in anything and everything except where God has placed it, his word. And so it's essential for us to recognize here that the Spirit leads us to the truth of his word. We need the Spirit guiding us, illuminating us, and we need, we need his word to help understand this world he has made. These two things go hand in hand here. And then chapter 17 is where we get the prayer, the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you were here a couple months ago, we had Mondo Gonzalez with us, and he really did a great job emphasizing what Jesus is doing in the high priestly prayer. But I just want to highlight for you a couple observations. Uh, look at chapter 17, verse 1. Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and then he begins to pray. When he had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, so chapter 17, verse 1, begins speaking, Father, the hour has come. Six times in this gospel, he'll say, the hour's not yet come. It's not time. It's not time. It's not time. Just like when you're waiting for Christmas. Not today. Not today. Not today. My son's birthday is a, is a week out. Not today. Not today. Not today. Next week. Next week. The hour finally has come. Glorify your son 
that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. You've got to underline this in your Bible. Here's the clearest definition of eternal life that we have. Because sometimes we think of eternal life as just like a whole lot of life or like clouds and, and rainbows and harps and, and diapers and all, all that stuff. This is eternal life, right? This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's what eternal life is. It's knowing God. That's why Jesus has come to make God known. Remember that from chapter 1, verse 18? That's the purpose. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who you have sent. And so the son's ministry here is is concluding on the earth. And he says this, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And then look at this breathtaking statement, chapter 17, verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He's thinking all the way back to in the beginning, before there was time, before there was a planet, the glory that he had as the only son of the Father, triune God, truly God of truly God, existing eternally in glory. Father, glorify me with that glory once again that we had together before the world existed. Incredible statement of the divinity of Jesus. And so he prays for himself. And then in verses 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples. He prays that, that they'd be strengthened for the time ahead. And then he prays also in verse 20. Look at chapter 17, verse 20. He prays for the disciples, but not only for his disciples, but for you. Did you know Jesus prayed for you? Like physically, like with his actual human body and words, he prayed for you. He said this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's you. Because through the chain of history, believers have passed down the faith to you. This is you. That they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so the world may believe that you have sent me. God, give them a distinct and unique unity, unlike anything the world can comprehend. Unite them by your spirit, God. That's what he's praying for here. So that people would believe. Do you see the word belief? They believe you have sent me. And he goes on to pray more there for us, but, but time would fail us if we were to try to plumb the depths of everything that he does here in this private ministry as he prays. But following the private ministry here, by preparing the way, he's the way, once he departs, the helper's going to come, and remember that Jesus has prayed these things for us. In chapters 18 and 19, we see the passion ministry. That's the hour that has come. And so we see Jesus' trial before Pilate. I love how John records the trial before Pilate here in chapter 18, because Jesus has clarity about what he is doing. Uh, Chapter 18, verse 37 He's standing before Pilate being questioned on being the king of the Jews. And here's what Pilate asks him. Jesus described how his kingdom is not from this world. And so Pilate says to him, once again, another example of humans misunderstanding what Jesus is saying. So you are a king. (laughs) My kingdom is not of this world. Oh, so you are a king. And then Jesus answers, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What's the truth? It's the truth of who he is as creator God come to pay for sin. In verse 38, Pilate asks the postmodernist's favorite question, what is truth? And imagine that. He's standing there face to face with the Son of God, who has said, I've come to bear witness to the truth. He says, well, what is truth? And notice that there's no response recorded for us in Scripture. And it's almost as if the silence of the Lord and looking him in the face helps Pilate to recognize the foolishness of asking what truth is to the man who is truth personified standing before him. The Son of God is in front of him and he asks, what's true? And notice the next statement after he said this, He went outside and told them, I find no guilt in him. He saw it in his eyes. 
This man is different. This man is innocent. This man must be who he says he is. It's incredible interaction here between Pilate and Jesus. Uh, The crucifixion takes place. John records for us the famous phrase of Jesus. It is finished as he gives up his, his last there on the cross. His side is pierced. In chapter 19, verse 35, it says this. Again, remember the theme of John. Believe, believe, believe. So blood and water comes out of Jesus' side, a clear sign of death. And then verse 35 tells us, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling you the truth that you also may believe. These things, took, these things really did take place. And so following the crucifixion, we get the account of the resurrection. Uh, the, the resurrection account also includes uh, doubting Thomas, who does not believe that Jesus truly has risen from the dead. In Jesus' interaction with Thomas, the word believe is used four times in their discussion together. And he finally believes once he feels the holes in Jesus' hands, his arms, his wrists. And then John gives us the purpose of the book. This is where it's placed in the narrative. It's after the resurrection. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written, but these, these seven signs, why do we just go through that in lightning speed? These seven signs are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That is John's purpose in this book. And then the postlude happens. John concludes his book by showing us how how Thomas believes He gives us the purpose and looks at you, the reader. These things are written so you might believe. And then he shows us how Peter and John are transformed by their encounters with Jesus Christ. We get two unique slices here where where Peter and, and the Lord are walking together and he's describing to Peter the kind of death he's going to undergo. And Peter believes it. He also describes to John how he's not going to die in that way. John, one of the last apostles alive when he's authoring the book of Revelation, and John believes as well. And so it's amazing to see how they describe the emphasis on belief here. Thomas believes. Reader, you should believe. Peter believes. John believes. And then John concludes his book with this great statement. He says this, right? There's a lot of content here, but he says, now there are also Many other things that Jesus did. Jesus did a lot more than we can record and write down on paper. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that will be written. And I love this statement. He cannot be contained within the world itself. That is a fitting description of the Son of God entering the creation. The creation cannot contain him. The creation can't even contain everything that he has done. Not even the world itself could contain all the books if we wrote everything he did. And so it's another nod to the divinity of Jesus. The world itself can't contain the Son of God. And so the question John asks us, you've seen him drive it home time and again, is this. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who has paid for sin? Do you believe this? That is the one question that John spends 21 chapters trying to drive home in our hearts and minds. This is the Son of God. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? And it makes a difference in daily life. I think of what J.C. Ryle, he says it this way. Once we recognize the reality that God's Son has come for us, if God has given His Son to die for us, let us beware of doubting His kindness and love in any painful providence of our daily life. Whatever struggles you're going through this week, just recognize if you believe that God truly sent His Son for you, just know He loves you. He's given His greatest gift to you already. He loves you and He's with you in whatever painful providence you're going through at this moment. Love that statement from Ryle, because when we, when we recognize the wonder of the Son of God coming for us, we recognize the love of God and that his disposition towards you is love in Jesus Christ. And so those questions that we ask, what is John trying to show us in this book? Well, John is nice because he tells us, he tells us the answer. And so who is God in this book? Well, here's what John has to say. God is made known through his Son. He's made manifest. He's illustrated. God God the Father is accessible through the Son. That's what we have seen in this book. How does it point to Jesus? Jesus is 
According to chapter 1, verse 14, God in flesh. The word became flesh. Do you believe this is the question he asks us. And why did the Holy Spirit inspire this book? John told us. So that you may believe and have life in Jesus' name. So you can have eternal life. That's why the Holy Spirit put this book in the Bible. So you understand who Jesus is and you can have life in his name. That's the goal of John's gospel. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Yes. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this book and the amazing truth that the Son of God has come. Creator God, who from eternity past has come into his creation. And Lord, our minds will never be able to fully comprehend that reality. Just like John says, this, the, the books of the world could never fully articulate what Christ has done. But Lord, would you help us to believe this truth, to have life because of it in your name, and help us to trust in you more and love you more as a result of our time in your book. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, next time, we're going past, we're, we finished the Gospels, so we're on to the book of Acts, and it'll be pages 75 to 87. And you'll notice it's Acts part one. Oh, get to take a breath. Get to slow down a little bit in the book of Acts, all right? So we'll see you next time. God bless.